Hi everyone and welcome back to our CACI Cost of Living podcast. Um, a lot has happened since we last uh, recorded one of these, um, including the mini budget that got announced, but also further action from the Bank of England uh, to control inflation. So lots to talk about today. Um, this week we welcome back Rachel, who is back to talk about transactional spend data. Um, we're going to be look at, uh, looking at observed spend data from the last two months. So we're really interested to know how things have changed and um, so we'll come to her in a second but Paul I'm going to start off with you because we have seen a lot of economic uh, activity I was wondering what you've seen looking at your spend forecast data. Yeah thank you thanks Hannah so yeah what we have done um, and we planned this uh, as a result of so much uh, change that's happened recently is that we've built a new version of paycheck disposable income traditionally we update it once a year but this year, because things have been moving so fast and we've been running all these scenarios due to the rising energy costs and rising inflation to to speculate about what might happen, we decided off the back of the mini budget, that was a time to actually rebase things and set a new version of paycheck disposable income. So that is available now. So what we've been saying, seeing, and it's probably worth me just putting up a slide for those of you who are able to see it. So what we've seen overall is compared to our version of Paycheck Disposable, which was set at the beginning of the financial year, so the start of April, we have seen average disposable incomes falling by a, by a 5%. And obviously, we'd already been on a bit of a slide by that point, but 5% down effectively over the rest of the financial year. Now, we've also seen disproportional effects across different groups. The version that I've got on the screen sort of summarizes it. I know it's a busy chart, so if you're watching this, feel free to pause it. But yeah, basically, the salmon colored piece there is the actual sort of disposable piece. And you can see that varies massively. So in the world of sort of mature money, not only have they got reasonably good incomes, they've also got 48% of that is disposable. However, you work down the acorn groups and you end up with people like struggling estates on much lower incomes and only 28% of that is disposable. So the key headlines that we're seeing is alarmingly we now have four ACORN groups that have disposable incomes of less than £10,000 per year. We've also seen the biggest declines amongst the groups student life and city sophisticates. So traditionally relatively affluent groups they, um, but yeah, they have been disproportionately impacted by property costs. Now, just to stress on student life, remember that not all of student life is students. A huge number of those are people in that sort of post-student life, renting properties, trying to get onto the mortgage market for the first point. And yeah, we have factored in the rising costs of variable mortgages, which could disproportionately affect these two young groups. So that is concerning. But we've also seen, yeah, as it says there, striving families seeing a 6% fall in their incomes. That's actually, they're not at the very, very bottom of the ACORN group, but we think that they've been affected a little bit more because quite often they will fall just above the threshold of the extra £650 um, energy um, support that have been given to the lowest income 8 million groups. So actually, we see this point that, yeah, whilst at the bottom things are really, really tough, it may be the striving families group that's actually been squeezed the most of those. OK, so that's what we're seeing on disposable income. Also, though, for the first time this year, we've also looked at how many households we think may be effectively living beyond their means who actually have disposable incomes less than their income. Now, obviously, we're using modeling and averages here, but it does tell a slightly concerning but interesting story. So if I can actually get that to move forward. So the key, key standout number here is that since the version that we did in um, April, we think that the number of people who are on negative disposable incomes has risen by 38 percent. OK, a massive headline shift. And what we're seeing as the group that are most likely to be in that situation, it's actually not the very bottom group. It's the one above struggling estates where we think that 16 percent of that group could have outgoings greater than their income, meaning they are very likely to be running up debts and taking potentially risky loans to pay that off. 
and particularly as they, as I've put on the notes there, are likely to have a relatively limited safety net. City sophisticates and student life, we've flagged them already. Potentially their mortgage is getting them into a challenging situation. So between eight and seven, seven and eight percent there may be living with incomes um, lower than their outgoings. But remember, we've talked about this before. These are the ones who are potentially more likely to be able to survive off savings or potentially the sort of the bank of mum and dad, which actually brings us to an interesting one that, yeah, even though very small numbers of those sort of highest income groups are living in that sort of negative world, it still may have knock on effects on their spend if they are now having to support someone else in their family who is needing that support due to their the, the squeeze. So, yeah, that is what we're seeing. Paycheck disposable income is, is now available and we will be running more scenarios in subsequent ones of these sessions to see where we think that's going to move. So I will stop sharing and hand back to you. Thanks, Paul. That's, uh, that's really interesting. And it definitely um, aligns with some of the things that we saw in the survey last week um, around um, people becoming just as worried about their family and friends' finances as they are about their own. So they kind of the worry definitely boosting. Rachel, I'm going to come over to you now um, because I know you've been doing um, lots of crunching of this data. And I was going to ask you, first of all, around uh, bills so that kind of essential spend, because um, there was a pretty negative picture of uh, kind of across the board, people's bills generally going up um, for the most part. What have you seen in the last two months? Yeah, so it's, to be honest, a pretty similar trend. Um, no good news yet, unfortunately. Um, so firstly gas and electric bills so household bills have increased by 51 percent year on year and um, when we're looking at august now this is 47 percent year on year in july and when we spoke to you around the june data it was 42 percent growth versus last year so those gas and electric bills are steadily like, increasing and increasing as we're starting to go into winter yeah and that is despite the fact that there's been no major step changes in that time but this is because a lot of people will have been on fixed uh, fixed bills which are now starting to end so that is an understandable rise and worth pointing out that unfortunately that does mean that some people will still continue to see those bills going up uh, relative to last year even though we have now got the government's um, fuel price cap yeah yeah exactly um petrol is the second we talked about last second i guess the central spend we talked about last time so we're seeing 13 percent growth year on year there now this has gone down from when we talked last time and it was 28 percent um year on year but we have seen that pump prices have decreased um and the price of petrol has decreased very slightly in the last two months so that has i guess yes it's still growing faster last year but not as bad as always it was in june i think that just shows that petrol is one of those essential spends that people aren't trying to cut down their spending on um and when you look at the different demographic groups there isn't really any difference in terms of the growth between your affluent um consumers and your less affluent consumers um but gas bills there is we do see that more affluent um households their bills are or gas and electric bills are increasing way ahead of um, the less affluent groups showing that the less affluent groups are probably trying to cut down within household bills, but not necessarily as much through petrol. Really interesting. Um, OK, let's talk a little bit about kind of F&B and leisure and those kinds of things, because I think um, it's been a difficult, a difficult time for them. There's been lots of stuff in the news about how um, energy bills are increasing for pubs, um, for example, and how difficult a winter it's going to be for them. What have you seen in the data in terms of how people have already been changing their spend in regard to those kinds of places. Yeah, before we talk about f and I just want to um, give you a bit of a holistic view in terms of all non-essential spend and how people are spending it. Last time, what we saw was non-essential spend. So like you said, anything from f and right through to fashion, right through to leisure activities, um, holidays, for example, we saw that it was pretty flat year on year, um, but there was actually a huge disparity between different acorn groups. So if you remember the chart I showed last time, we saw that really affluent people were growing their non-essential spend and it would just trickle down and down and the less affluent um, consumers were in negative um, year on year growth in non-essential spend. I'm going to show you what the picture looks like um, through the August data. Um, so what we have seen is that every group has started to decrease their non-essential spend um, and 
there has been an increase um, for only one group and that's lavish lifestylers. So really showing that people are conscious and trying to cut down their um, non-essential spend um, this can, as we have as we come towards the end of the summer. I think that completely goes back to your point, Paul, in terms of, OK, some of these groups who are more affluent, they do have that disposable income, but they are still really conscious in terms of they don't want to spend too much money. They might need that money. They don't know what the next few months are going to hold. They might be helping um, younger members or less fortunate members of family or friends out. Um, struggling estates cutting down their um, non-essential spend the most, so down 6% um, in comparison to last year, which really does show that they are really having to cut back now. Um, and we'll talk about the categories um, that are driving that a bit later on. Um, starting out um, is another group. So these are young, really young um, consumers. Um, again, not super affluent, but going to be kind of trying to kind of grow their careers and their families and they're also cutting down significantly so some real trends there that back back up what um paul's um data is showing it's really interesting and i'm just correct me if i'm wrong but that's not weighted to inflation is it so so actually that shows a real strong effort from most consumers in the country to cut back on spend even though yeah. things are more expensive yeah so you would almost expect the baseline of that to be around nine percent to be honest um so really showing and transactions are, i don't have the exact figure but transactions are down way more than spend um in non-essential um categories um so yeah okay. um okay. But, yeah so going back to your f and b point um that's one of the categories we're seeing the most churn and change through different categories and it's really interesting so i thought it was worth spending some time today talking around it um so what we have seen is restaurants are down um, 11% year on year in terms of spend and down 8% in terms of transactions. Um, we do think this is because people are going to restaurants less, less often or less people are going to them. This is unsurprising. We've been talking about it for months in terms of that's where people are going to start saving money. But it's not all doom and gloom for the F&B um, sector that are... What, areas within that sector that are growing and doing quite well off the back of back of this the first being fast food chains are growing um showing that so fast food chains are up three percent in terms of spend versus last year sh showing that people are potentially switching from restaurants to fast food and we see that most significantly with city sophisticates who are um those affluent city dwellers um they notoriously love going out um for dinner but actually they're not stopping doing that necessarily they're just likely to be choosing um restaurant sorry like choosing fast food over restaurants so they're growing 14 percent year on year in fast food in terms of spend but down 19 percent in terms of restaurants and they're down the most out of any group within restaurants so that's really interesting um also pubs and bars are doing well so spends up in pubs and bars and now we're looking although we are looking year on year back to 2021 we feel like august to august is now quite a reflective period and people were kind of back to normal behavior in terms of pubs and bars last summer um so we are seeing that increase the total spend but the average trans transaction value has gone down showing that people are probably likely to still go out um with their friends but might go for one or two at the pub rather than go to the pub all afternoon and have um a meal and lots of drinks so it's just around people are being less extravagant when they are going out but it doesn't seem that people are doing it less frequently they're just choosing carefully where to go just to make sure they can still go out and have fun really interesting what about um a category like fashion which has obviously seen a fair bit of turbulence in the last couple of months as well yeah um so we are seeing a decline in spend and transactions within fashion so down 15 percent in terms of transactions versus last year and 16 percent down in spend um but this is across all acorn um groups and there's not too much difference um in terms of different acorn groups and the proportion they're cutting down um will be really interesting to look at and we will try and have a look at this in future um podcasts is understand what what's happening to that decrease are people just not buying 
clothes, accessories at all and cutting down volume or are they deciding to trade down within different brands? Are they going from luxury to uh, mass market fashion or are they going from mass market fashion to value fashion um, or just completely changing their habits at all? So that would be really interesting to look at the future. I mean, I was in central London this weekend and it was really busy, full of people shopping. So it seems like footfall's doing OK. Um, but yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. Um, I was in central London recently as well and noticed the same thing. A lot of people seem to be buying big, bulky goods items as if they were potentially already shopping for Christmas, which could be yeah. an interesting thing to see if people are trying to almost spread the cost of that big event over a couple of months to try and make sure that it's not too much in December. Yeah, definitely. It'd be really interesting to track this spend over the next couple of months just to understand what is going on with Christmas shopping and what people are doing um, and where people are spending their money for Christmas as well. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of that, we are going to go into field very soon with another survey that's looking specifically at Christmas behaviour. So I think in the next podcast, hopefully we'll be able to answer some of those questions around um, intention for Black Friday, how people's gifting behaviours and travel travel behaviours around Christmas might change this year. Um, are there any categories where you've seen increases in spend as opposed to decreases? Yes, yeah, so there are two really interesting ones that I picked out. So first, what well, firstly is gambling. So we're seeing five percent increase in spend um, in gambling um, across a significant portion of different demographic groups, um, and that's aligned to what you sort of have seen in the survey as well. So I thought that was quite interesting. Um, the second one where we've seen, again, quite a significant growth, 17% um, year on year is gyms and fitness. Um, I think this is probably people getting back into their routines and wanting to go back to the gym. So positive that a category like that, which some people, a lot of people would say it's kind of non-essential or a more, um, I guess, luxury is growing and people want to do it. So that is really positive, I think. Interesting. Um OK, uh, one big category that we haven't actually covered off yet, grocery. What has been going on in the grocery market? Yeah, so quite similar to last time we talked about it, um, to be fair, we've seen an increase in transactions um, and spend um, year on year. Um, but we've seen ATV again decline, showing that that behaviour starting to change in terms of going more frequently, but buying less when you do. Um, the one thing for me that's really interesting is that there's not much different difference when you look at the different demographic groups in terms of how much their spend has changed year on year. So I think spend is up by 3% across all demographic groups. And bear in mind that nine, it should be going up 9% if you were almost buying like for like what you were last time. So we do know people are cutting back, um, but that's true right from lavish lifestyles all the way through to struggling estates um so people are starting to change their habits i think we've seen a lot in the news um and in the press around affluent shoppers um starting to switch to your aldis and Lidl's of the world and we've seen that through aldi's market share increasing um for example um but that's fine for affluent groups. For the less affluent groups, I guess the really hard thing is they are buying less, but they've already been spending, trading down within the supermarkets and trading down within products. So it is not the nicest story, um, to be honest, but it'll be interesting to track this going forward and seeing what's happening. And we are planning to do so. So we're planning um, or in development of a new product um, called Brand Dimensions. Uh, which looks to track all this um, changing in different brands. So looking at all the different grocers um, and understanding growth and decline in them from a different from different Acon group uh, perspective, as well as in fashion um, as well and in F&B. So definitely something that's going to come down the line, hopefully in future podcasts, we'll be able to talk about more um, as well. Yeah, definitely. It's an interesting one, isn't it? Because there's also been so much around um, the price matching between supermarkets as well. And I imagine that probably has smoothed out some of those trends a little bit because you've almost they've almost hit a bit of a rock bottom in terms of how much they can price things at. Um, and that's kind of universal. Yeah. So, yeah, it will be interesting to see how that changes. OK, thank you so much, Rachel, for coming back and sharing the latest findings from that data. 
So next month, it's just the me and Hannah show. So Hannah is going to be sharing the latest survey data. So um, specifically focusing on those Christmas trends. So thank you, Rachel, for wearing your Christmas jumper seemingly today. Um, but yeah, we'll be back um, similar time next month with that latest survey. Thank you for listening.